Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. And now we begin part three, Ajamil Repents, and chapter 17, The Moment of Truth, from Canto 6, Chapter 2, Text 24 through 33 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Shukdev Goswami continued, After hearing the discourses between the Yamadutas and the Vishnu Dutas, Ajamil could understand the religious principles that act under the three modes of material nature. These principles are mentioned in the three Vedas. He could also understand the transcendental religious principles which are above the modes of material nature and which concern the relationship between the living being and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Furthermore, Ajamil heard glorification of the name, fame, qualities and pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He thus became a perfectly pure devotee. He could then remember his past sinful activities, which he greatly regretted having performed. Ajamil said, Alas, being a servant of my senses, how degraded I became. I fell down from my position as a duly qualified Brahmin and begot children in the womb of a prostitute. Alas, all condemnation upon me. I acted so sinfully that I degraded my family tradition. Indeed, I gave up my chaste and beautiful young wife to have sexual intercourse with a fallen prostitute accustomed to drinking wine. All condemnation upon me. My father and mother were old and had no one to look after them. Because I did not take care of them, they lived with great difficulty. Alas, like an abominable lower-class man, I ungratefully left them in that condition. It is now clear that as a consequence of such activities, a sinful person like me must be thrown into hellish conditions meant for those who have broken religious principles and must there suffer extreme miseries. Was this a dream I saw, or was it reality? I saw fearsome men with ropes in their hands coming to arrest me and drag me away. Where have they gone? And where have those four liberated and very beautiful persons gone who released me from arrest and saved me from being dragged down to the hellish regions? I am certainly most abominable and unfortunate to have merged into the ocean of sinful activities. But nevertheless, because of my previous spiritual activities, I could see those four exalted personalities who came to rescue me. Now I feel exceedingly happy because of their visit. Were it not for my past devotional service, how could I, a most unclean keeper of a prostitute, have gotten an opportunity to chant the holy name of Narayan when I was just ready to die? Certainly it would not have been possible. Purport. Having heard the conversation between the Yamadutas and the Vishnu Dutas, Ajamil became firmly fixed in Krishna consciousness. He began to lament how unfortunate I was to engage in so many sinful activities. This is the proper attitude for a Krishna conscious devotee. Whatever he may have done in the past, 
no matter how sinful. When he comes in contact with devotees and hears transcendental topics in relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavad Katha, he becomes purified and laments his previous condition. Indeed, the symptom of his purification is that he laments having behaved so sinfully. He repents and discontinues his past grievous conduct. Ajamil was now at the stage of devotional service in which one is freed from all material impediments and is completely satisfied. Ahaituk yapratihata yayatma suprasiditi Having reached this platform, Ajamil began to lament for his past materialistic activities and glorify the name, fame, form and pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One who takes to Krishna consciousness naturally endeavors to follow the rules of devotional service and he regularly chants the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. A person should not suppose that because he has taken to Krishna consciousness, he can continue his sinful activities and have their effects counteracted. We have repeatedly warned that this is the greatest offense against the holy name. Like a Jamil, one should repent. How unfortunate I was to engage in so many sinful activities. But now, by the grace of Krishna, I have come to know that I was acting improperly. Thus Ajamil greatly repented, remembering all his sinful activities. He remembered that he had been trained by his father to be a first-class Brahmin, that he had been educated in the science of the Vedas, and that he had married a beautiful and chaste wife, a girl who was innocent and highly qualified, having come from a respectable Brahmin family. Ajamil now lamented, I rejected her and accepted a prostitute, an abominable drunkard. It is a Vedic regulation that men of the higher classes, Brahmins, Kshatriyas and Vaishyas, do not beget children in the wombs of lower class women. Therefore the custom in Vedic society is to examine the horoscopes of a girl and boy being considered for marriage to see whether their combination is suitable. Vedic astrology reveals whether one has been born in the Brahmin class, the Kshatriya class, the Vaishya class or the Shudra class according to the three qualities of material nature. The horoscope must be examined because a marriage between a boy of the Brahmin class and a girl of the Shudra class is incompatible. Married life would be miserable for both husband and wife. Of course, this is a material calculation according to the three modes of nature, yet it is important for the peace and prosperity of the family and society. But if the boy and girl are devotees, there need be no such considerations. A devotee is transcendental, and therefore in a marriage between devotees, the boy and girl form a very happy combination. Ajamil thought, because I failed to be self-controlled, I was degraded to an abominable life and all my Brahminical qualifications were nullified. This is the mentality of one who is becoming a pure devotee. When one is elevated to the platform of devotional service by the grace of the Lord and the spiritual master, one first regrets his past sinful activities. This helps one advance in spiritual life. The Vishnu Dutas had given Ajamil the chance to become a pure devotee, and the first duty of a devotee is to regret 
his past sinful activities in illicit sex, intoxication, meat-eating, and gambling. Not only should a devotee give up his past bad habits, but he must always regret his past sinful acts. This is the standard of pure devotion. Ajamil repented his negligence in performing his duty to his wife, father, and mother. It is the duty of grown-up children to render service to their aged parents. This practice should be reintroduced into present society. Otherwise, what is the use of family life? Proper family life means that the husband should be protective, the wife chaste, and the children grateful to their father and mother. Children should think, My father and mother gave me so much service. When I was unable to walk, they carried me. When I was unable to eat, they fed me. They gave me an education. They gave me life. A bona fide son thinks of ways to render service to his father and mother. And just as a woman is expected to be faithful to her husband, so the husband should be grateful for her service and protect her. Because of his association with the prostitute, however, Ajamil had abandoned all his duties. Regretting this, he now considered himself quite fallen. According to the Vedic social system, as soon as one takes birth, he becomes indebted to so many persons. We are indebted to the rishis, or great sages, because we derive knowledge from their transcendental writings, such as the Srimad Bhagavatam, compiled by Srila Vyasdev. The authors of the scripture know past, present, and future, and we are urged to take advantage of such invaluable knowledge. Thus we are indebted to the sages. We are also indebted to the demigods, for they manage the affairs of the universe, supplying it with every essential. Sunshine from the sun god, Surya. Moonshine from the moon god, Chandra. Air from Vayu, and so on. Each element is controlled by a particular demigod. We are also indebted to ordinary living entities from whom we take service. For example, we take milk from the cow. According to Vedic understanding, the cow is considered one of our mothers because we drink her milk, just as at birth we drink our mother's milk. The Srimad Bhagavatam lists seven mothers. Our own mother, the wife of our teacher or spiritual master, the wife of a Brahmin, the wife of the king, the nurse, the cow, and the earth. We are indebted to all seven of these mothers, and also to our father, brothers, friends, relatives, and forefathers. Also, if someone accepts charity, he becomes indebted, and that debt has to be repaid, just as borrowed money must be repaid. Therefore, devotees should not accept charity from anyone unless they intend to spend it in Krishna's service. For a devotee to accept donations just to satisfy his belly is a great sin. Brahmins and sannyasis who accept charity from others must accept it with great caution. According to the Vedic social structure, only the brahmachari, sannyasi, and brahmin are allowed to collect money in charity. An ordinary householder must not. The brahmachari may collect alms from the public for serving his spiritual master, and the sannyasi may collect money for serving God, Krishna. 
The Vedas likewise direct people to give charity to the Brahmins because they know how to spend it for Krishna. Charity given to a worthy person is in the mode of goodness. Charity given for one's own personal benefit is touched with the mode of passion. And charity given without any consideration is sunk in the mode of ignorance. For instance, if we give money to a rascal, he will likely take it to the nearest liquor shop. Those who are rich may think it does not matter. They can afford not to discriminate. But the scriptures describe these three kinds of charity. We may well ask, how can one hope to liquidate all his debts? The answer is, only by taking shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna or Mukunda. The name Mukunda indicates one who liberates us from material contamination. We are indebted to the demigods, but we cannot take shelter of them. If we actually want shelter, we should take shelter of Krishna, because he alone can free us from all debts. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and if he excuses us, then all other departmental managers, such as the demigods, must also excuse us. Ajamil understood his position as a debtor. But since he had now taken shelter at the lotus feet of Mukunda, all his debts were cleared. Simply by taking shelter of Lord Narayan, who is non-different from Mukunda, Ajamil became free. Similarly, if we want to be free from all sinful reactions, we have no alternative but to surrender to Krishna. As Krishna recommends, Ma me kam sharanam vrja which means, quote, simply surrender unto me, unquote. We should follow Krishna's advice. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to liquidate all our debts to so many persons, especially in this age of Kali. In the material world, there is danger at every step. Even for those who are pure devotees, there is the danger of falling down from the standard of purity. However, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 5, Verse 17, Narad Muni assures us, Pyaktva svar dharmam charanam bhujam harer, bhajana pakvo tapate tato yadi. Yatra kva vabhadram abhuda mushya kim kovarta apto bhajatam svadharmata. The word dharma in this verse means occupational duties. A Brahmin, for example, has certain occupational duties. Similarly, a kshatriya has his, and so also do the Vaishya and Shudra. If a person gives up his occupational duties and takes to Krishna consciousness, strictly following all the rules and regulations, but if, due to his immature execution of devotional service, he falls down, there is still no loss for him. Whatever he does as service to the Supreme Lord, although it may be a small percentage of his whole life, will remain to his credit. He does not lose it.
On the other hand, one who perfectly executes his occupational duties but fails to worship Krishna ultimately gains nothing. Strictly discharging one's occupational duties means living a life of piety. But suppose through these pious activities you are promoted to the heavenly kingdom. Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that as soon as the effects of your pious activities are finished, you will be forced to return to this planet. Another point, if a person performs pious activities in this life, such as giving in charity, he must return here in the next life to accept the beneficial results of his pious actions. That means he must accept another term of material life. So it is not a sound idea to hope for acquisition of the effects of pious activities. Unfortunately, even in India, people are more inclined to perform pious activities, such as giving in charity, than to take up devotional service to Krishna. They hope that by performing such tapasya or austerity, they will be elevated at death to a higher standard of material life in the heavenly planets. They also worship demigods for this purpose or to gain a benediction in this life. Lord Shiva, for example, very quickly gives his worshipper material benedictions, whatever his devotee wants. He is very kind. He is known as Ashutosha, he who is easily satisfied. For this reason, people are fond of worshipping him for material prosperity. But Sri Krishna condemns such worship in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verse 20. Kamais tais ter rita jnana prapadyante niyadevata, which means, quote, those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender unto the demigods, unquote. The Srimad Bhagavatam tells the story of Vrikasura, who sought a terrible benediction from Lord Shiva. Vrikasura asked that whoever he would touch upon the head would be destroyed. This is the sort of benediction sought by demons. Ravan and Hiranyakashipu also received such benedictions. They thought that by becoming powerful they could elude death. This is typical demoniac mentality. None of these demons, however, was saved from death by the benediction received from the demigods. Rather, ultimately they were all killed by the Supreme Lord. It is nature's law that everyone here must die. No one who takes birth in the material world can live eternally. The material world is called Martyaloka, meaning that every living entity here is subject to birth, death, old age and disease. In illusion, people do not see this. They try to adjust their material condition so that they can live perpetually. Modern scientists also aspire to be immortal in imitation of Hiranyakashipu. This is all foolishness. One should not be afraid of dying, but one should be cautious and ask, what sort of situation will I attain in my next life as a result of my activities. A devotee is never afraid of death. He simply prays to Krishna, I may die and take birth again repeatedly as you like, but I only ask that in whatever condition I may live, by your mercy I will never forget you. A devotee is not afraid, but he is cautious not to fall down. At the same time, he knows that whatever percentage of devotional service he renders is to his permanent credit. The story of a Jamil is the perfect illustration of that point. We should follow the rules and regulations very strictly, but even if we fall down, there is no loss. That is the statement of Nard Muni quoted above. 
even if one takes to Krishna consciousness on the basis of sentiment and executes devotional service for only some time and again returns to material life, whatever service he has rendered is recorded and one day he will be saved just as a Jamil was saved. After the Vishnu Dutas disappeared, Ajamil at first wondered whether he had been dreaming that they had come to release him from the binding ropes of the Yama Dutas. When Ajamil was on his deathbed, practically in a coma, he actually saw the Yama Dutas and Vishnu Dutas, but it seemed to him that he was just dreaming. When he saw that he was in fact released from the fearsome agents of Yamaraj, he wanted to see the Vishnu Dutas again. They had appeared very splendid. Their bodily features were just like those of Lord Vishnu, and they were decorated like him and carried the four symbols of his potency, the conch shell, lotus, club, and disc. Their bodies shone with a very beautiful luster, and their dress was of golden silk. Therefore Ajamil inquired, where are those beautiful personalities who released me from the bondage of the Yama Dutas? Ajamil thought, My whole life was full of sinful activities, so how could I be worthy of seeing such great personalities? He concluded, Perhaps in my previous life I did something good, and as a result I have been allowed to see the Vishnu Dutas. In fact, early in life, Ajamil had been a faithful servant of Lord Narayan, and as a result, he was able to see the Vishnu Dutas. It was the good association Ajamil had been blessed with in his early days that saved him. As stated in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, chapter 22, verse 54, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastre Kaya, Lava Matra Sadhu Sange Sarva Siddhi Haya, which means, quote, The verdict of all revealed scriptures is that by even a moment's association with a pure devotee, one can attain all success. Unquote. In the beginning of his life, Ajamil was certainly very pure, and he associated with devotees and Brahmins. Because of that pious activity, even though he was fallen, he was inspired to name his son Narayan. Certainly this was due to good counsel given from within by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As the Lord says in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 15, verse 15, Sarvasya chaham ridi sanevishto mata smritir gyanam apohanam cha which means, quote, I am seated in everyone's heart, and from me come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Unquote. The Lord is so kind that if one has ever rendered service to Him, the Lord never forgets Him. Thus the Lord from within gave Ajamil the inspiration to name his youngest son Narayan, so that in affection he would constantly call Narayan, Narayan, and thus be saved from the most fearful and dangerous condition at the time of his death. Such is the mercy of Krishna. Guru Krishna Prasade Paya Bhakti Lata Bija, which means, by the mercy of the Guru and Krishna, one receives the seed of bhakti, devotional service. Watering this seed by the process of hearing and chanting the name of the Lord saves a devotee from the greatest fear. 
In our Krishna consciousness movement, we therefore change a devotee's name to one that reminds him of Vishnu. If at the time of death, the devotee can remember his own name, such as Krishna Das or Govinda Das, he can be saved from the greatest danger. Therefore, the change of names at the time of initiation is essential. The Krishna consciousness movement is so meticulous that it gives one a good opportunity to remember Krishna somehow or other. Remembrance of Krishna at the time of death is generally possible only for persons who have established an intimate relationship with Krishna throughout a lifetime of devotional service. When Ajamil was a young boy, he was trained by his father to be completely faithful to the Lord, and until the age of twenty he served Lord Narayan very nicely. Although Ajamil had fallen down from the standard of devotional service to Lord Narayan and forgotten his relationship with him, Narayan did not forget, and in Ajamil's hour of need he reciprocated his devotee's love. Thus Ajamil was given the presence of mind to remember Narayan at the time of death. Krishna is very appreciative of even a small amount of devotional service. He confirms this in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 40. Neha bikrama na shosti pratyavayo na vidyate svalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato vayat which means, quote, in this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution, and a little advancement on this path protects one from the most fearful type of danger." Unquote. If a person practices even a small amount of devotional service, it can save him from the greatest danger. So why not take to Krishna consciousness? Engage in devotional service always, 24 hours a day then there is no question of danger. One who has become Krishna conscious is fearless. He knows he is under the protection of Krishna.